This is going to be according to this agenda, but what we are seeing is the point system, the full suite of documents. So oh yeah, Clara is really new.
Presenter Amalai Oyaki from JPL. I think we all have to. Uh, what, do you, what do you do with? You have to wish real hard. Anybody lose? 
feet, swaying from side to side. Does anybody like a swing? Okay. Amala, you need help hooking up here? That one just kind of moved in. The other isn't in. Glad to hear I'm not the only one. Okay, where's a, uh, somewhere here is this. Do you have a sound port? Possibly fit into it. Do you know how to split the, an Apple display? What? Apple display. Split, just split it to the screen. So.
I'll be starting in about a minute once everybody gets settled in. Sound check, good. Okay, all right. Uh, my name is uh, Amalai Oyaki. I'm in. Uh, I work for uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab. I work for an instrument uh, science data section. And uh, for the past, I would say, about the past ten years, I've been working with a group of people at JPL. Um, on networking uh, things in space or s simulated things that are supposed to be in space. <laughs> and uh, the title of my talk is The Internet of Space. Uh, it's, a, it's a play on the, 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 the popular term, uh, Internet of Things. So I'm gonna get into this a little bit. So I'm gonna be introducing and mentioning a lot of people along the way and citing uh, lots of material, so there will be a lot of material in this presentation that uh, it was created by other people, so uh, you'll see some of that. So uh, a bit about me, I work uh, in, in, a, in an instrument group, but uh, many, many uh, years ago I used to work in a uh, software infusion group, and the purpose of that group, the group was led by Abdullah Al Al-Jabri, and um, there was a project at JPL called uh, Deep Space One, some people may know of it, where uh, they flew LISP on board a spacecraft. Uh, it happened, this never happened again. <laughs> but uh, uh, but it, was, it was really, it was really, uh, really a cool mission, but the, the leftover hardware from that mission, the, the, the single board computers, uh, basically uh, RAD 750s and a bunch of other things, were all lived in a rack. And the group I was in, which was the infusion group, uh, their job was to basically uh, take new sort of application layer, high level software, and try to infuse this into a flight software architecture. So, um, uh, so some of the people, uh, Scott Burley, Scott, you can wave your hand. So Scott Burley is, um, uh, flight software programmer, DTN architect, I say for NASA. <laughs> there are so, a few other people, but uh, as far as I know, Scott's the person I work with and uh, is the NASA lead for ION DTN in terms of software development and works for the Interplanetary Network Directorate. That's a very cool sounding name. And I think that's led by Jay Wyatt. Jay's over there. Uh, a few other notable people. I uh, just want to say hello to Larry Bergman, who's sitting in the audience. So, so. I uh, work for Larry as well, uh, lots of cool people. But a lot of the work uh, uh, sort of started with uh, s some of these people. And I, I, at the time, was working in this uh, software infusion group. Uh, there is another lab at JPL. It's called the uh, Protocol Technology Lab. We also call it the Protocol Test Lab. That's led by Lee Torgerson. And uh, he is uh, mainly uh, one of the key CCSDS points of contact at JPL in terms of testing lots of these protocols and, and, and those sorts of things. So we do every year, we do lots of very interesting uh, protocol uh, tests uh, between uh, JPL and also with, with other NASA centers. Um, so I, I shared a little bit about myself. So as part of my work for this um, infusion group that I was a part of, um, Scott worked in something called the flight system test bed basically it was a, a lab in the corner of the spacecraft assembly area. And people were doing tests all the time and with their flight hardware, and they needed to do message passing between their, the, the flight computer and the ground GDS systems, which were at the time mostly SunSpark systems and maybe some other things. But uh, Scott had written a, a published and subscribed uh, software called Tramel at the time. I remember it, so I, I did use it. And that was the thing that people used. And so, but the world of DTN was sort of, sort of being created and sort of message passing and things like that. And the task I had, it was many years ago, in fact, I, it's been so long ago, was to port 
Scott's work, which lived on these workstations into VX Works, and you can see what happened. And so that was sort of the beginning of the sort of the long journey of, of this. And so uh, I did the first VX Works port, and then I did a port on uh, an Artemis port, Vion, and worked with some other interesting people. I worked with a person by the name of Takahiro Yamada on something called the Spacecraft Monitor and Control Protocol. Uh, which was a monitoring control protocol, uh, kind of a RESTful API for spacecraft uh, instruments and devices. So uh, we got to sort of the CTFDS draft level, more or less, you know, rejected, saying, you know, we missions aren't going to do this because missions do their own thing. But the interesting thing is JAXA took this and just has pretty much gone crazy with it. They they use this, they basically matured this protocol within their organization and. I got an email from Takahiro, oh, we use this on all our missions. And so I go, okay, that's interesting. And then, so when I see sort of RESTful APIs and things like that, it, it reminds me of uh, some of our work uh, on that. But, um, so what is IoT, the general ideas? You, know, you see IoT everywhere, the terminology. And so what you, you generally, the feeling you generally get is IoT is the next big thing. I mean, companies are spinning up, hiring people, you have whole marketing departments. Uh, everybody's doing something on, on this IoT stuff. But um, you hear certain claims, oh, if you, if you want to do Internet of Things, if you want to connect your toaster to the Internet, you better have a persistent and reliable Internet connection, uh, something with a network address. You need TCP, UDP, JavaScript, HTTP, and something cool sounding. That's, you know, some nice, um, something like Node.js or some other, I don't know, so you, you just whip out something cool sounding to make somebody feel inferior, but you know, that's generally the feel. Oh, we've got this cool language, you know, it's being able, we can communicate with um, all these different things. And devices can be networked using web protocols or there's some other protocols. And you can even purchase very powerful IoT frameworks to enable smart devices. So you can go to, um, uh, certain companies that I will not mention and buy their IoT frameworks and network all this stuff and do lots of cool things. And you can spend a lot of money doing that. But, um, and I have this line here. It says, ignore everything listed above. So that's all cool, but part of the premise of this uh, presentation is that a lot of the IoT ideas and claims, uh, while they are very exciting, are not entirely new or original, and you actually may not need very much to network device A to device B. De you know. And the interesting thing is that you might even, the thing that you're talking to may not even be a device. It may not have power. You may not even be able to talk to it. It might just have an RFID patch on it, and that's it maybe with a temperature sensor, something like that. So you may not need much to talk to something that you're trying to observe, but uh, a good thing to note is that there are many standards bodies that actually deal with uh, networking and communication and all these sorts of things. And so ITU, CTIPT, CCSDS, OMG, IETF, DTNRG, OSF, ISO, and our ham radio friends. Anybody here have a ham radio license? So, like I said, while IoT is presented as something new, uh, it's, the ideas are not really new. Uh, so people have been networking things for a long time. Uh, might sound silly, but with sound, fire, smoke, uh, the sun, electrical signals, and telegraphs. So some examples, there's a very excellent book. Um, it's, I think it's out of print, but if you're doing anything IoT related, I strongly encourage you to get this book wherever you can find it. It's hard to find. I have two copies. I don't lend them out. So, um, one is the one I read, and the one is the one I hide away if, in case <coughs> I lose the one I read. So, uh, so some of the examples of networking are uh, Alexander the Great's uh, twelve-foot megaphone, uh, Claude Chappie's semaphore system, basically a messaging system with these arms. You kind of did like this, and you know, you could get a whole alphabet. Um, CM's electric telegraph concept, 1753. Zuhu's telephone system, 1796. The Swedish telegraph 
system in 1796 with a data rate of half a bit per second. You can actually go to Sweden, and I think some of these still exist, actually. Uh, Cook and Wheatstone's Electric Telegraph, 1837. And uh, many of these systems were actually used for uh, networking train signals. So if a train's going into a tunnel and another one's uh, going into a station, you could say, okay, train number one, go ahead. Train number two, stop. Train number three, just wait till everybody gets out of the way. And uh, what they discovered, if you read this book, it's really interesting, is that uh, there were protocols for how these uh, vehicles, trains, uh, interacted, how they uh, went through tunnels and came out of tunnels. And what they found was that the protocols were sometimes, oftentimes, incompletely specified. So you had, you had an incident like uh, the Clayton Tunnel train uh, crash, where uh, one train went in, another train went in too fast before the, uh, the signal could be sent that, oh, there's, another, there's a train actually in the tunnel. Third train came along, uh, you know, didn't see the signal, and you, know, you had a major accident. So <coughs> some networks uh, that existed over, I would say, the past uh, 40 years, some of these uh, are Aloha, Autodin, ARPANET, SATNET, Autodin2, Sabre, which is used in the airline industry, and a few, uh, many others. And uh, if you read publications by some of these organizations, uh, UCLA, University of Hawaii, and lots of other places, you, you'll find a lot of documentation on uh, uh, their efforts <coughs> in their networking. So here's a picture of the book. I just wanted to add this. So this is the book. And on the cover, you can see the, the um, Chappie semaphore system that was used. So that made up a, a full alphabet, I believe, of uppercase and lowercase. Uh, uh, characters A through Z. And uh, so if you, you ever stumble across this book, uh, do get it. We definitely recommend it. So, so some other historical notes that I also wanted to uh, point out. These are really interesting papers. And when you read them, you really start to see that the ideas of networking things, uh, and particularly uh, e uh, electronic devices and having some kind of intelligence uh, were being looked at uh, by, by lots of people. So one really interesting paper is um, on distributed communication networks uh, from the RAND Corporation by Paul Baran. Um, another uh, really interesting memo was the um, memorandum for the members of the affiliates of the Intergalactic uh, Computer Network. Really interesting uh, uh, paper. If you can find it, it's easily downloadable, read it, really interesting. Uh, Vince Cerf's store and forward packet switching uh, discussed in uh, packet uh, communication technology, uh, packet communication technology protocols and techniques for data communication networks in 81. And um, a lot of the stuff that came out of small talk. And I actually got this from uh, the, um, there's, a, there's a famous conference in, in Australia. It's called the Yao Conference. And uh, one of the speakers was uh, Gregor Hoppe. And, and, and and, and I saw this, and I said, this is, this is, uh, and I, then I talked to Scott Burley about it, and um, this was really interesting. He said, the, the big idea with small talk was, was not objects, but was messaging and uh, passing messages. And uh, it was something that was never quite completed uh, during their time at Xerox Park. So I found this really interesting, that the idea of, 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 of objects or, or devices sort of existing, uh, a big part of it was just them being able to pass meaningful messages between one another. So a few pictures from some of those uh, talks. So this is um, the all digital network, uh, Paul Baran's diagram. And so in the picture, you'll see actually a heterogeneous network of uh, television stations that are uh, that function as network uh, devices, also buried cables, and also a satellite link on the say 1962. It's I found it really interesting. Another is from Licklider's uh, paper, and uh, these are some of the graphics that are in his paper. He says, "What is a node?" And uh, he point, and this is from 1968. He says, "An operating system, graphical display, in interpreter, user program." Sounds like sounds like Unix. This is 1960 something. So, found it really interesting. All nodes can be connected. 
uh, can be interconnected via their message processor. So they came up with a concept of interface message processors, or IMPs. And so when they created the ARPANET, and this is a, this is a BBN diagram, uh, there's a really interesting article uh, that came out not too long ago that captured a bunch of the historical ARPANET diagrams, and I cited that here, but this is one of the diagrams, the 1971 picture of the ARPANET. So you have the interface message processors, a bunch of PDP machines, and, and the networks that exist. So you had UCLA, UCSB, Stanford, and then uh, looks like Case Western University, Carnegie Mellon, and a few others. By 1973, uh, there was a satellite link between uh, University of Hawaii and uh, Ames, and uh, lots of other little nodes somewhere uh, uh, in different places, but the, the network had grown, and so they, they were building up this network. The very interesting thing is, uh, there's a book by um, Franklin Quo, F.F. Quo, um, where they basically uh, discuss uh, networks that are bridged using satellite links. And so they have this concept of a satellite in interface message processor. So instead of your, your typical interface message processor, you now, have, you now have a satellite that is now a message passing uh, device. And so uh, they demonstrated this, and uh, he has an interesting book too that's also out of print, very hard to find, uh, where he discusses uh, their research on this, where they have a satellite link in various regions and nodes. And this reminded, this, pic this particular picture really reminded me of the, uh, the DTN implementations and, and just the, the network architecture. I found it very interesting. So, so all of these things are things that were done in the, in the 70s and the 60s. So we can see that, that people were trying to network things, at least pass packets, message passing, switching, things like that. So I'm saying that, you know, none of this is new. So what is new? So the, n the newness is the, the easy availability of small, low cost, what using the ARPA terminology, interface message processors, IMPs, or small compute nodes, uh, Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, BeagleBoards, all kinds of very cheap computers. Um, there's a very cool.